I'm going to take for granted that everybody here knows that global warming and climate change are extremely serious problems that can reshape the map of the world in terms of human activity and many other things besides. But what has been the main problem when it comes to climate change? Is it not knowing that the pro problem exists? Is it not having the scientific and technological resources to prevent global warming? Well, it, it's neither of these things. It's neither. In fact, scientists have been warning about the, globing, the warming of the planet for decades now. Decades. And what, is, what we see happening right now, this year, the hottest ever on record year. The one before was the hottest before, before that period, and this one is even more. The glaciers are melting, the sea ice is being reduced at the poles, there are stronger storms, floods, and droughts, and all of this leads to enormous misery for millions of people. But it's just a confirmation of what the scientists have been predicting. That's, that's what it is. They've been saying that's what what was going to happen, and it's happening. Now, progressives, I think, in general, do understand quite well that it's the, in the capitalist countries, the fossil fuel billionaires have waged war against the science of climate change. They've spent huge sums and created uh, all kinds of disinformation and lies in order to discredit science. They may have delayed something being done about global warming, but they could not prevail forever. Global warming is now an established fact, and governments are forced to deal with it. A couple of months ago, if you remember, the latest of many international climate conferences took place in Paris. It came up with an agreement that the warming of the planet should be held to less than two degrees Celsius. And that they would try to make it even less than one and a half degrees. And this was hailed in the press as a great breakthrough. However, this agreement didn't commit any country to anything. The US in particular has fought at every one of these climate conferences to prevent any firm targets being set on greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to quote from an article that's just appeared in The Nation about the Paris conference. It says that when, law when US lawyers who were over there in Paris discovered a phrase declaring that wealthier con countries shall, the word was shall, that they focused in on, set economy-wide targets for cutting greenhouse gas pollution. Secretary of State John Kerry told the delegates, and this is a quote, we cannot do this, and we will not do this. And either it changes, meaning the wording of this statement that was going to go out from the conference, or President Obama and the United States will not be able to support this agreement. So the word was changed. From shall, meaning you shall do something, to should, you should do something. So even a statement that vague, which didn't say what cuts should be made, just that there shall be cuts, that was rejected by the US government at these talks. The final agreement turned out to be nothing better than a wish list to Santa. There is nothing in it to threaten the workings of capitalism, and especially the fortunes of the fossil fuel magnates who have run the show in this country, especially Ever since the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company took over 40% of the oil production in the US back in 1890. Now, John Kerry and the Obama administration are supposed to represent the liberal pole 
in U.S. politics. So what hope is there that the U.S. capitalist government will do anything meaningful to rein in the giant corporations? And they would rather see the world destroyed than give up a small fraction of their profits. There is, of course, an opposition, a movement, that's opposed to all this. More than a year ago, we were all there, I think, some 400,000 people marched here in New York City demanding action against global warming. There was a strong anti-capitalist sentiment um, among many in that march. And it has only grown in this country, I think, since then. But it's not enough to say capitalism's bad. You have to think about how do you get rid of it and what do you build in its place? Now, we are inundated all the time with anti-socialist, anti-communist propaganda. Basically, what this propaganda boils down to is, that, is this. Only people from the ruling class and its agents are capable of running a society. The worst possible thing would be a revolution in which the working people, the oppressed people, take the power away from the rich. That's what it's really, that's what they're really saying. Now, there is one major country in the world that went to the Paris Conference with a detailed plan and a commitment to redirect its con economy away from fossil fuels and toward non-polluting sources of energy. Its plan also includes measures to improve energy efficiency and then trans transmission and to reforest vast areas in order to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. What was that country? It was the People's Republic of China. What makes China different? And why do the capitalist rulers see it as a menace, as a threat? It's because it did have a revolution. And the oppressed masses did take the power away from the ruling classes. The leaders of that revolution were communists. And right away, they were threatened by the US imperialists. China has since then made big concessions to capitalism and capitalists. But the state born out of that revolution has not been overthrown. Even with the concessions, even with China allowing capitalist firms to exploit Chinese workers, even with all the contradictions that brings into a society pledged to building socialism, there is still a world of difference between the capitalist, imperialist US and people's China when it comes to dealing with global warming. Now let's not forget that China is still a, de a developing country. Just a, a generation or so ago, the majority of its people were terribly poor. Yet, China today is able to do what John Kerry himself said the U.S. absolutely cannot do. China is committed to taking very specific measures to reorganize its economy and reduce its carbon footprint. So how do the Western imperialists explain that? Well, I'm going to read to you from several different publications. The first one is The Economist, which is a very establishment financial publication in Britain. This is from uh, April 10th, uh, 2013, which would be almost three years ago. And they said then, in the West, it is often said that one of China's chief advantages in dealing with climate change, they're admitting that back then, China was doing a lot about China, climate change. One of their chief advantages is that its leaders can impose tough policies that democratic systems shy away from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's democratic to not do anything about climate change, but it's bad that t China is tough and is doing something about it. <coughs> but then they admit that China's carbon emissions 
and this was, as I said, almost three years ago, are growing at half the rate of the G GDP. So the economy was expanding twice as fast as the carbon emissions were expanding, which is a bit better than the global average. China, this is continuing to quote them, China has also boosted investment in renewable energy far more than any other country. It has the world's most ambitious plans for building new nuclear power stations. To combine economic growth and environmental improvement, China has concentrated on reducing carbon intensity. This fell by about 20% in the past five years, the five years before 2013. And the government is aiming to cut it by 40 to 45% by 2020, which is only four years from now compared with, with two, 2005. Meanwhile, of course, the economy has expanded tremendously. Most of the improvement is coming from a scheme to bully. They use the word bully here. This, remember, this is the economist speaking. Most of the improvement is coming from a scheme to bully 1,000 state-owned enterprises into using energy more efficiently, arguably the single most important climate policy in the world. And they go on to give a lot of, I'm going to read a lot from them because they, this is not China saying this. This is, this is this conservative publication in Britain. The enter, and this is how it works in China. The enterprises sign a contract with the central government agreeing to meet efficiency targets, abide by new building codes, and install environmental control equipment. This is something you remember that Kerry said, no, the U.S. cannot do this. This helped Chinese cement makers, and they say, who produce as much of, of cement as the rest of the world put together. It helps them reduce the energy needed to make a ton of cement by 30% in the 10 years to 2009. The scheme has now been expanded to 10,000 state enterprises covering the majority of polluters. China is also generating energy more efficiently. According to the World Bank, better operations and the closure of clapped out plants. I don't know what that means. It's a British expression. I'm not sure what it means. Maybe it means plants that are uh, outdated. Help to push the average thermal efficiency of its coal-fired power stations from 31% in 2000 to 37% in 2010. America's remained flat at 33%. So in those 10 years, while China was reducing, uh, was uh, increasing the thermal efficiency of, of using coal, the U.S. wasn't doing anything at all to improve that. The other big energy change is China's vast renewables program. The government aims to get 20% of its energy from such sources by 2020. So that's wind, solar, um, biomass, I guess, what they call the renewables. That's not counting um, nuclear. Uh, so they're expecting to get 20% of their energy from uh, renewables by 2020. The same target as in richer Europe, the economist says. The largest slice will come from hydropower, which accounted for around 15% of total energy in 2012. Uh, but the big rise comes from wind and solar. The government will roughly double investment in these two in 2011 to, tw to 16, which is now, compared with 2006 to 10. Chinese investment in renewables puts others to shame, says the economist. It amounted to $67 billion in 2012, more than three times what Germany spent. The aim is to have 100 gigawatts of wind capacity and 35 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2015. China is the world's lowest cost producer of solar panels. And you know what the U.S. did about that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they went and slapped a huge tariff on Chinese solar pa panels so that it make, if you are somebody who wants to use solar panels here to heat your home or something like that, you're going to have to pay a lot more money for it and buy them probably from American companies. And this is supposed to be all to save jobs here, but it's really to make profits for the companies here. Um, 
So then finally, the final quote from The Economist is, a few years ago, Chinese politicians said such emissions would go on rising at least until 2050. That was, that was saying that, there, that uh, greenhouse gas emissions would rise until 2050. That was a few years before 2013. So it would have been sometime in the first decade of this century. They said that. Now, mainstream Chinese opinion says the peak will come in 2030 to 40. And ac academics at the Energy Research Institute and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences reckon it could come earlier in 2025 to 30. So even though the Chinese government has not yet said that they definitely will be able to bring the emissions down by 2025, 20, uh, they, I think they said 2030, but they really are aiming for 2025 to bring the emissions down, to begin to actually lower them even though their uh, industrial capacity has expanded so greatly and they're generally the use of energy and everything will have expanded so greatly because China has been getting so much more urban, so, so much more developed. So that's what the, the, the British said about it. Now listen to what the Council on Foreign Relations says about China in an article that they entitled China's Environmental Crisis, because they wanted it to sound really bad for China, right? But they say, the Council on Foreign Relations, by the way, is with the Rockefellers. In December 2013, China's National Development and Reform Commission, the, enemy's top, the, the country's top economic planning agency, Planning agency, this is what you gotta keep in mind. They have planning, they have economic planning. It issued its first nationwide blueprint for climate change, outlining an extensive list of objectives to achieve by 2020. Since January 2014, the central government has required 15,000 factories, including large state-owned enterprises, to publicly report real-time figures on their air emissions and water discharges. And the government has pledged to spend $275 billion over the next five years to clean up the air. Now, of course, you know this is a big problem in China, the air, as we all know. They just had a terrible pollution, in, uh, especially this time of year, in Beijing. So there was a, they put out a red alert. Think London in the, in the 1890s, because it's coal. It's the burning of coal that adds so much pollution to the atmosphere. And that's what they're trying to get away from with the development of uh, renewables and uh, nuclear power. Um, okay. I did that. Um, oh yeah. Uh, more recently, China's legislature amended the country's environmental protection law to allow for stricter punishments against companies or individuals caught polluting the environment. This again, this is from the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. China is also one of the biggest investors in renewables. Its spending could total $300 billion in the five years through 2015 as part of its pledge to cut its carbon intensity. So these figures are an update from what I read to you before because this, this was written uh, it, th last year, I think, and the other one was written almost three years ago. Yeah. Um, so, uh, according to its Nuclear Energy Administration, renewable energy sources comprised 57 uh, no, it's National Energy Administration. Renewable energy sources comprised 57% of newly installed electricity generating capacity in the first 10 months of 2013. So more than half of the new installed generating capacity came from renewables. No other country in the world is doing anything like this. Um, and finally, let me read you something that CNN said uh, just about, uh, about two years ago. E e I wish I could have found stuff more recent, but I don't know, they stopped writing about this. <laughs> Every day across this vast country, th this is about ch China now, and they're talking about protests in China against, about the environment. In this country that they had said, that you know, the earlier 
thing I read you said was they're so dictatorial. There's you know they could there's they can be so uh, heavy-handed and all that. But there's been protests uh, much more than than elsewhere. Every day across this vast country, there are hundreds of local protests about the environment. China's Society of Environmental Sciences reports that protests about the environment have grown by an average of 29% every year between 1996 and 2011. There are some reports that a majority of the organized protests in China are about the poor quality of air and water. The good news for China and the world is that Beijing seems to be listening. China has promised to spend $280 billion cleaning up its air. We know about that already. Um, but I bring this up, this particular quote, because we shouldn't look at something that the Chinese government does as just, well, they just do it. it there's a dynamic. There's a class struggle. The, the masses of the people in China are not disenfranchised. They're not being dictated to. They play a big role in the decisions that are made. It is, it is their country, and they de are demanding. They feel it's their country. They don't feel it's somebody else that, you know, so, oh, the big shots run it. Well, we can't do anything. We're just small people. No, they're out there in the same way that they're out there as workers, uh, when, especially when the um, uh, foreign-owned businesses were exploiting the Chinese workers so terribly uh, uh, back a few years ago. They were out there in strikes. Just they, they were, I think I gave a talk here once where I pointed out that they had had something like 10,000 strikes in China in a period when the U.S. had like 31. <laughs> uh, so the Chinese workers are very active, they're very involved, and they're saying what they want the government to do, and the government is, is doing it. Maybe not always to their satisfaction, you know, but, and maybe sometimes they can't do everything that people want. Maybe, you know, what, you're, what if you're building a dam somewhere in order to provide hydropower, and there's people living there, and they don't want to be moved. It's a, it's a problem. Any socialist government would have to take up a problem like that and try to figure out the best way to deal with it. Um, anyway, but this CNN thing ended up saying that China's carbon emissions per unit of GDP have dropped by half since the 1990s. And massive investments in wind and solar. So, and then the CNN report ends up like this. So, we have the strange irony that dictatorial China responding to public protests, is cleaning up its air faster than democratic India. <laughs> but India is really a capitalist country. And China has capitalism, but it's not a capitalist country. That's the difference. Uh, so according to the US media anyway, it's dictatorial to make a plan and to carry it carry it out, a, a, uh, an economic plan. Of course it is, because it means that you're telling the government, the, the people who, in, who are in power of the, over the government, are telling the owners or the managers of enterprises what to do. They're not supposed to do that in a capitalist country. The, the ca in the capitalist country, the capitalists tell the government what to do. They write the laws half the time. You know, the banks write the financial laws, the polluting companies write the laws for the uh, environmental protection. I mean, there's been so much recently. There was just a, a, a fascinating article in the New Yorker about uh, DuPont polluting a whole area of West Virginia with this horrible chemical that got into the water and everything. And the EPA for West Virginia, which was supposed to be the one to, you know, make sure that this didn't happen, it was all the, the, the uh, chemical and coal industry people who picked the people to be on the EPA. And <laughs> so, you know, this is more than just local corruption. This is the way it works. This is the way the system works. Um, and of course, uh, of course, it's democratic, you know, to have billionaires like the Koch brothers and Wall Street financiers dictate the policies that have left cities like Flint, Michigan, with poisoned water uh, and d d just uh, ecological disasters all over the country, and the whole the whole Midwest 
is which was a you know the, the center of uh, uh, industrial capital uh, for many 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 decades. Uh, at one time, I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and at one time, the uh, the Great Lakes just died. I mean, millions of fish were washed up on the shores of the Great Lakes because of the, the pollution of the Great Lakes. They had to do something, you know, about that later. But mainly, what happened was they closed the plants and moved them to pla to places where they could pay lower wages. What China does is going to be really crucial for the world. We hear all the time that China, a few years ago, surpassed the U.S. in greenhouse gas emissions. But, and they did. It was just a few years ago. But don't forget this. China has almost four times as many people as the U.S. So per capita, the U.S. is still by far the largest polluter, not just historically, which is absolutely indisputable, but even right now. And if you look at it on a per capita basis, uh, they've lo one way they have lowered some emissions in the U.S. is that they've moved a lot of their manufacturing operations abroad to get cheaper labor. Um, this hasn't helped the earth, <laughs> but it has lowered U.S. emissions. So, you know, I, I, I just want to sort of conclude with this. When you look at this whole history of the last hundred years, you know, this is 19, this is 2016, right? Just 99 years ago was the first successful socialist revolution. And we all know it lasted 70 years, but it, it was overcome in the end. And there could be, a, there's, I'm sure there's been a lot of pessimism in many quarters ever since then. But if you, but if when future generations look back on this time, they won't be saying, well, was that revolution too early? Should it maybe, should maybe they have waited? Maybe Lenin shouldn't have pressed so hard to take the power when they were so weak. Of course, Lenin thought, hoped that there would be revolutions in Western Europe that didn't happen. Uh, but they won't look at it that way. They're going to say, it's great that the revolution started when they did. The, our planet could have been destroyed if, the, if capitalism had gone any further, if, if the revolutions hadn't started when they did. And China's, you know, China shows that by, ha by bringing about socialist revolution, you can deal with these problems. You can turn things around. It's not impossible at all, which I think is what the feeling is among so many uh, in the environmental movement right now, is how are we ever going to turn this around? Well, we have to, you know, look to the path of revolution. That's why... I mean, naturally, we want to try to do everything we can to get them to stop doing this and stop doing that and, you know, strengthen, uh, strengthen environmental laws and so on. But basically, we look to revolution. We look to the masses of people. We look to those who suffer the most under this system, the oppressed, the workers, to, to make the changes that are necessary to end this her terrible crisis that uh, capitalism has brought the world into. Um, I guess I'll start with the questions about uh, the economy. Well, let me start with something else, first of all. Um, it's been the, this party's history, really. Uh, not to just rubber stamp something that uh, the leaders of a socialist country do, but to think of it critically. Uh, when there was a turn to the right in China, I mean, the, uh, the head of our party, uh, Sam Marcy wrote several pamphlets analyzing the struggle that was going on within the Chinese Communist Party and, uh, and said that the, when Deng Xiaoping's policies took over, it was a turn to the right, but not that it was the counter-revolution. That's very important to remember. Not that it was the counter-revolution, but that it was a turn to the right. Um, and I think we can say in many ways it was forced on them. I mean, <laughs> they didn't have m many directions they could turn at that point, I believe. But we don't have to rubber stamp their decisions. We have to look at it objectively and see what's happening with China. Um, and uh, and I, I think that when you, <laughs> when you look at the capitalist world economy, as, as uh, John pointed out, has been in more or less of a crisis since 19... Uh, 2000, 2007, 8, that 
uh, downturn, which Japan has not had any improvement in their economy since, or most of Europe has not. The U.S. has gone up and then seems to be maybe heading down again. Uh, I would look at it this way. China has had steady development. If you look at the figures for economic growth in China, employment, um, wages, they all rise not like this, but like this. Steady. That's a characteristic, not of a capitalist economy, but of a planned economy. Now, the crash came in the West. It created problems for China, as, as John was pointed out. China has held up the capitalist world since the crash. It's been China's continued growth that has provided them with a market and a place to invest their, their excess capital. But they couldn't do it forever. They can't hold up the whole capitalist world. Capitalist crisis is breaking out again, it seems. And I think Sarah wrote a good piece for our paper a little while ago, showing how there was a surplus of all kinds of basic commodities. That surplus, not that people don't need them, but that the uh, capitalist economies cannot absorb them and they can't sell them, and so they have a glut. So I would look at this whole question that of what the, uh, pay, you know, what the capitalist economists are saying. I would say, look at it the other way around. China can't hold up the whole uh, capitalist uh, international system. <laughs> they can't do it. And some of it can hurt them as it goes down, and they may have uh, problems. But China is not in a crisis. They're not in a crisis. The stock market had a crisis. Some of the investors have had a crisis. But China has not had a crisis. Chinese production continues to grow, and these plans show that they're trying to put it on a very rational basis in terms of how to deal with the, uh, the environmental disasters that are looming and already have already started. Um, so that's one point. I think uh, on the question of the um, uh, a capitalist, uh, a, a Chinese billionaire uh, buying something in Africa. We have to make a distinction between the billionaires and the capitalist and the, and the Chinese government. The Chinese government allows capitalism in China, and so Chinese have be some Chinese have become fabulously rich. Some of them have gone to jail, too. Did you know that? There are billionaires. One of them was executed recently. When was the last time a, a billionaire was executed in a capitalist country? I mean, there's a struggle, you know, and, the, and China is trying to, you know, not have it burst out into something big. But there's a struggle going on all the time between these people who have become very rich, and they want to invest their money. And so, a, uh, a Chinese business person who has made a whole lot of money is looking for a place to invest it. And they think that they're going to make more money by putting money into China, into, a, into a con something in, in Africa. But alongside this, the Chinese government has entered into agreements with the governments of Zimbabwe, of South Africa, uh, of, of a whole bunch of different countries in Africa that have been very beneficial for those countries to develop their infrastructure. And that's what China is helping them out, is in developing railroads, power, uh, uh, you know, this I infrastructural development, which they're not, they have not been getting from the World Bank or from the IMF. And that's why they've turned to China. And they're very happy about this. And uh, I, Abiyomi has written a number of articles for our paper about uh, the attitude of the African Union towards China and, uh, and how they, you have had big, high-ranking delegations going both directions between African countries and, and China itself. Um, 
you, you, Monica, you pointed out that the Dow Jones here has plunged and they said the problem, the, the immediate reason for it is crude oil and what's happening in China. Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> they want to make a lot of money off of China. They do. I mean, that's what capitalists want to do in their relations with any, every country. They want to make a lot of money off of them. If they can't make a lot of money off of China, if they think that they're not going to get a big return, they, they, they panic, you know. They'll, they'll start saying, oh, you know, we can't, we, they're responsible. We're in a crisis, they're responsible. Because they, that, there's been, because China is not providing them with the kind of cushion that they got when the, when the Chinese economy was expanding and, and seeking investments. China has amassed a lot of capital in, in the course of this last 20 years or so. And a lot of it has gone into the general infrastructural development of the country. I just saw recently somewhere that China now has the most extensive, most developed scientific infrastructure in the world in the world, academies, universities, think tanks, all addressing scientific problems. I get a, a scientific magazine uh, called Science News. It's a digest of stuff that's appeared in more technical publications so you can understand a little better. But in the back pages, uh, because of the people that read this thing, they have a lot of ads, you know, for um, uh, companies or governments or, or entities around the world looking for scientific personnel. So they put an ad in, oh, you know, you can get a position here and there. Half the ads are from China. You know, they're looking for experts in every field, biology, uh, uh, geology, uh, everything. So it's, the, the country has had enormous development. I don't believe in any way that they're responsible for the capitalist crises. We know capitalist crises occur again and again and again, but they're getting worse because capitalism as a system cannot function well when there's an abundance. It goes into crisis when there's abundance. <laughs> they, need, they need markets for their goods. And uh, when, there, when, the, when countries develop their means of production and don't need to buy much more from the capitalists, the capitalists go into crisis. Um, China and nuclear power. And, and is nuclear power safe? Um, I wrote a, a couple articles in the paper about this uh, recently because I know we've all grown up in, in the United States in the shadow of uh, Three Mile Island, uh, thinking about you know what happened at Chernobyl, thinking about Fukushima in Japan, and the the uh, the uh, uh, nuclear energy infrastructure in the U.S. is very old. The average age of a U.S. nuclear plant is 36, and a lot of them are older than that. They're only supposed to be licensed for 40 years. I live five miles from one of them, nuclear, the one at Indian Point. And you go to a bus stop up there, and there's a thing telling you what to do if there's a nuclear emergency. We get stuff every year with directions on what to do if there's a nuclear emergency at Indian Point. So it's a, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not pro-nuclear from some starry-eyed point of view. I would say these plants are dangerous, very dangerous, and they should be decommissioned. Um, but they're gonna, you know, the main reason that they're dangerous is because they're <coughs> privately owned by capitalists who want to make a buck. And they are operated that way. And even though there's all kinds of regulations to try to make sure they don't get too dangerous, there's a struggle that's just been going on in New York State between Cuomo and uh, the um, uh, and the uh, a company called Sen Entergy Entergy that operates nuclear plants at Indian Point and another one up on La uh, Lake Ontario. And Cuomo has been pushing Entergy to close one of the ones at. Um, it's, it's like f over 40 years old now. That's at Indian Point. But, but uh, keep the one going in, on, on Lake Ontario because the one at Indian Point is within 35 miles of New York City and 12 million people. 
And there's a lot of, you know, thing that we don't want dangerous nuclear plants in such a heavily populated area where you can't evacuate. How do you evacuate people, you know? I mean, we'd be a madhouse. Synergy, I don't know what they're trying to get. There's probably, they're try probably trying to get uh, some deal. They announced they were going to close the one on Lake Ontario and keep the one at Indian Point going. Then Cuomo makes a lot of noise about that. But it's a privately owned company. The government can't tell them what to do, you see. <laughs> they can't say, this is too dangerous, close this down. No. Ah, it's a private enterprise. They've got the right to do that. But there are, there is a much improvement has happened in the design of nuclear power plants. And there is actually one that's now in the operational, um, um, uh, you know, developed the, to be, be operational already. Russia has one. Uh, China's building some. They're called fourth generation. They're not, there's only a few of them so far. They will be not only very safe, but they run. What fuels them is the nuclear fuel left behind by the first generation plants, which is a big problem around the world. What do you do with nuclear waste? And that's been one of the big arguments against nuclear power, is what do you do with the nuclear waste? And the fourth generation plants take, the nuclear waste, uh, if you take uranium and you put it, use it as fuel in the old nuclear uh, reactors, they would burn about 1% of the energy in that uranium. And 99% of the energy would remain in the nuclear waste to decay over something like 156,000 years. With the fourth generation nuclear reactors, they burn 98% so that there's only 1% left which decays in something like, uh, well no because it's already reduced you see by 1%. He's being, doing the math thing on me here. but. <laughs> But 1% is already gone. Another 98% of the original energy in the atom is used up in the, in the process, uh, used by the fourth generation uh, nuclear reactors. So only 1% remains. And it decays in a much shorter period. So that looks, they're still, you know, they're still figuring out stuff about, about these because they work, they operate at a very high heat. Certain um, metals have to be used. You know, it's it, it's still a, it's still in the stage of development, but there are some of them operating already. Um, but uh, damn, I had another point connected with this. Oh yeah, but here's the thing. Where's the danger to the world coming from right now? It's not coming from nuclear power. It's not coming from nuclear power plants. Or nuclear bombs, maybe, but not from nuclear power plants. I mean, Fukushima, everybody thinks that thousands of people died. No, it was just a handful. Just a handful of people died. More people died from being evacuated, because a lot of them were older people and all that, than died from the actual radiation. Same thing with Cherno Chernobyl. They're now going back to Chernobyl. There's people who never left. They refused to leave the area around Cherno Chernobyl. They're still there. They're still alive. <laughs> so meanwhile, you have devastating floods, storms, drought, you know, enormous change to the planet, which is going to cost so many lives happening. And it doesn't have anything to do with nuclear. It's all from the burning of fossil fuels. So what do you, you know, so, so there, there's, China I think has made a, the right decision. They have put a lot into renewables. Hydroelectric, solar, wind. They put a lot into it. Billions and billions. And they, till now about 20% of their electricity comes from that. But 20% is not enough to, to build a, uh, a strong economy. They have to have a reliable source of energy. Wind, solar are intermittent. The rain, the, 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 um, the wind has to be blowing, the sun has to be shining for you to get those things apart. Nuclear energy is around the clock, the same, around the clock. It's always available. So it's, you know, all these things have to be taken into consideration 
Chinese scientists have been thinking about this for a long time, I'm sure, weighing the do's and the don'ts. But they have come up with uh, having, to, having decided that they're building something like 56 new nuclear plants right now. In the United States, none, none have been built in the last 36 years. Uh, I mean, there's no, just no nuclear plants in the United States. Whether they'll do it or not, it depends probably on what the big billionaires decide they can do, make the most money out of. That's, that's what it is. If they think they, they could, that the shift to nuclear will benefit them, then they'll be for it. But the interesting thing about the fourth generation re nuclear reactors is they were developed in the United States first at the Argonne National Laboratory in a program from the 1990s. And they, the scientists were elated that they had come up with this, this new safe way of producing nuclear energy and energy for the people. They thought it was like a fantastic breakthrough. They were celebrating. Congress sh shut them down. Congress shut them down. You know who the, the point man on that was? John Kerry. He was, a, he was in Congress at the time. He was the point man. And there's books, there's several books that have been written about it by just enraged scientists who said, why did they do this? They can't understand why it was done. Why the whole project was shut down. After they had proven that it worked. They had actually proven that it worked. So, so the, you know, so other countries picked up from this research that was done and they developed it further and, for the, and, and, and they found out that they, it would work. And there are these nuclear op, uh, reactors operating now, uh, one or two in Russia and a couple in China, but I think China is going to go big for big in that direction in a few more years. But for the, in the meantime, they're, they're, they're building plants that are not the fourth generation so much. They're the, they're the, I think they're called the third generation. They're much safer than the, old, than the original nuclear plants, but not as safe as the fourth generation will be.